Psalm 129, we're really not sure who wrote this psalm or what the occasion was, and it was considered a song of ascent, and so we've talked about that. Um, it's quite possible that, and many Bible scholars believe that the, this psalm was penned after the children of Israel had returned uh, to Jerusalem after being in captivity in Babylon for 70 years, and so the exile as they return, and the psalmist, I think, is probably reflecting back on all of the different occasions in history when when the enemies of Israel had come against them, and he's beginning to write this psalm, reflecting in that, and at the same time, he's not only reflecting on the hardships that the enemies uh, had, had uh, inflicted on them, but also recognizing that even in all of that, God had been faithful and he had delivered them and the enemies had not completely destroyed Israel. And um, they won't. God has a plan for Israel, for his people. Psalm 129, he begins by saying, Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. And he's speaking of Israel, uh, not him in particularly, but the nation of Israel, greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, greatly have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. And he is recognizing again the fact that all of the enemies had come against Israel throughout the history of the nation from their very birth, from, from the time of God calling Abraham unto himself. Uh, of course, um, we, we know that that ended, the next period of history ended with the children of Israel in captivity in Egypt as they were enslaved there for over 400 years. Um, but God was faithful to bring one to deliver them out of that. And it's really kind of a, a picture of, of um, metaphorically that um, God always sends one to bring his people out of captivity. And you and I, before we came to know Christ, we were held captive by the enemy, uh, in chains of the enemy, enslaved to the enemy. But Jesus Christ, through the cross, has set us free from sin and death. And we have now been, become bond servants, slaves of Christ. He now owns us because he paid the price for us. And God was faithful to send uh, the Redeemer uh, to Israel, and he's been faithful to send the Redeemer Christ for us to redeem us from our sins and eternal damnation in hell. And then I think in verse 3, he perhaps is reflecting back to that time in Egypt because he says, the plowers plowed upon my back. Uh, they made long their furrows. Uh, the Lord is righteous and he has cut the cords of the wicked. Here the image is when, when a plow is going through the ground. I don't know if you've ever plowed. I've plowed quite a bit in my lifetime, uh, especially when I was growing up as a kid. But, but when, you, when that, that fur is placed into the ground, that hard ground, it, it turns that ground under and it plows deep furrows and rows and they're long. And so here he's using this imagery to show how when they were enslaved in captivity, it was as if the, the plowman had taken his plow and dug it into the ground and, and as it would be pulled along by the ox or whatever was pulling that plow along, it would turn the ground up. And the imagery here is, is the flesh and perhaps referring to and thinking of when the children of Israel were in slavery and being whipped with cords, how it would tear the flesh away. And he's using that as, as a metaphor of how uh, Israel has been uh, treated by their enemies. And he says in verse 4, But the Lord is righteous. The Lord is right. He is just. He's righteous. And he has cut the cords of the wicked, uh, that, that which the wicked would have used to, uh, to, to beat the back of the slave, to make those plow troughs in the back. God has, because he's righteous, he had he cut the cords of the wicked. Then he says in verse 5, May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backward. So here he's praying out. Uh, would all of those who hate Zion, and here uh, referencing Zion, 
again, is that place of the holy hill of God, representation of God's presence dwelling there, representation of the righteous people of God, those who were God's. He said, may the wicked be put to shame and turn back. Let them be like the grass on housetops, which withers before it grows up with which the reaper does not fill his hands, nor the binder of sheaves his arms. And so here is the imagery of, uh, in the East, a lot of homes uh, would, would have a dirt roof, and on top of it, grass would be sown, and it would grow so that it would provide an insulation there. But here the imagery is where the, where the depth of the soil is not much. And, and the grass would sprout up, but it wouldn't take, uh, take hold and take ground. It would not produce a, a harvest that would come from it. So uh, he's, he's using that imagery to say, let the wicked be like that. Before it ever is able to grow up and take root, uh, let them wither like the sun. Um, nor do those who pass by say the blessings of the Lord be upon you. Uh, we bless you in the name of the Lord. It was customary when one would be uh, harvesting the field that those that would come by uh, as, a, as a means of joy and jubilation that their neighbors were able to get a harvest, they would say, the Lord bless you. It's kind of like us saying, God bless you. It's a general term, just wishing well blessings on a person. And so he's saying with the, with the, with the grass on the rooftop, just like when the sun scorches it so that there's no harvest, people wouldn't be able to come by and say, the Lord bless you. And so here he's, um, he's again, thinking of all the times that the oppressor has come against the nation of Israel. Uh, and yes, they had suffered under that, but they had not gained complete victory where they had not completely decimated the hand, uh, the children of Israel. And he's reflecting on the faithfulness and the righteousness and the goodness of God. The application for us in our lives is that, uh, yes, we, we, we all face enemies. We face the enemy, and some of you today are facing an enemy, metaphorically, um, whatever that enemy might be. But God is faithful. And although uh, we face those things, we're reminded that in times past, when we faced other enemies, while we may have felt uh, the strain and the distress under that enemy's attack, it did not conquer us. Um, but that God was faithful and God delivered us in the hands, uh, out of the hands of that enemy. And you know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He always remains faithful. And you might be under a trial right now. You might be in a place of distress. You may be facing literal human enemies. Hold on. God is faithful. We are more than conquerors through Christ. I'm reminded of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8. Um, when, when, he, uh, when he says in verse 18 that, uh, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so Paul, we know in his life, suffered much, suffered much persecution for being a Christ follower. But he says, listen, when I think about these current sufferings in this life, they are nothing. I don't even, I don't even consider the sufferings of this present time. They're not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The hope that we have, Paul goes on to explain as believers, is that we have something that is an eternal assurance for us. So often we're caught in uh, the thinking of life just in this temporal period of time. But we can be assured, rest assured, that there is a day that we're going to see the full revelation of being the, the adopted daughters and sons of God. And this life, while it's full of trials and tribulations, Jesus said, don't be surprised when you face trials and tribulation. That is a part of this sin wrought world. But the hope that you and I have as believers is that we have an assurance. It's not a wishful hope. It's a solid hope that we have eternal life 
forever and forever with him. And there's absolutely nothing in this life that can separate, that can come between you and I as sons and daughters of God. There's absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. He goes on to conclude the chapter, and this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture, beginning in Romans verse 31. So let it be a reminder to you today that what then shall we say to these things, these trials, these tribulations, these enemies that come against us? If God is for us, then who can be against us? A rhetorical question there. Listen, God is on our side. Um, God is for us. He's not against us. Why? Because we have been forgiven. We have been set apart from sin by the shed blood of Christ. And we are covered in the righteousness of God in Christ through his blood. He who did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? In other words, who, who can bring a charge that, that will stick? No one. Why? Because Jesus has taken our punishment and our penalty for him. There is no charge that will stick. Not because we're anything righteous, not because we're anything right in and of ourselves, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Who shall bring a charge against us? Um, it is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who condemns? No one. Because the condemnation that we deserved, Jesus took on for himself. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ today, there is no condemnation. Your condemnation, your condemning has been taken by Jesus Christ. And so walk in that today. Who shall separate us from the love of God? of the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? It is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We're regarded as sheep to the slaughter. No, Paul says emphatically, no. In all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, I'm confident, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's absolutely nothing. You cannot even separate yourself from the love of God if you've been born again. You're secure in his love. Let's have a view today that, um, that life is not just this life, three score and ten, but life is eternal. And we have that hope of glory uh, that we will have eternal life with him forever and forever. My Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? He devoted that sacred head for sinners such as I. Was it for Christ that I?
you. I pray the Lord's blessing on you today. Uh, walk with him. Be a blessing to someone else and pray and ask the Lord, Father, would you give me an opportunity to share the incredible love of Christ with somebody that I come across in my daily life today? He'll answer that prayer. Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. Have a great day.